so today I would like to talk uh, about the Sky Server and, and all together. So this is how I got into big data. Until then, I was just uh, one of the many theoretical cosmologists doing basically dark matter and, and galaxy formation. And it really all started when, in 1992, Johns Hopkins decided to join the Sloan Survey. And one of my colleagues at the time felt strongly that we should not do this. And then the faculty meeting, when it came up to the vote, he said that we should on Hopkins only should join the Sloan Survey if one of us stands up and says that, okay, I will spend all my time on this project until it's done. And then it seemed like, okay, 92, it will be start in two years and we will finish by 2000. So that was the projection. So I said, okay, here is your man. And, and so we got in and the vote passed. And 16 years later, we actually finished. So, and there were some dark nights during that, that time. So several times the whole project was on the verge of bankruptcy. So we were like two months away, basically go from going on there. So we had, and then always some, in the last minute, some magic happened and some more money manifested itself. Let's hope the same thing happens with the summer school. So the NSF came through. Anyway, so, we like to call it the Cosmic Genome Project. So the, it started in 92 because the technology was just getting right to, to do this. So it was possible to build large format CCDs at the time at a reasonable cost. And there was a famous O'Hare meeting the year before. So that was, I believe, in 1991 when uh, Princeton and Chicago got with a group of selected people basically outlining that it was just barely possible to take kind of cutting edge technology in all fronts, including computing, to build a telescope, a special telescope with a wide enough, unprecedentedly large wide field imager that could first cover the sky in imaging, and then afterwards actually use the data itself to select the brightest million, galaxies, brightest million objects on the sky and follow it up spectroscopically. <coughs> So project started. The idea was that every institution takes pieces of the system, the hardware and the software system. So Chicago took, for example, the spectroscopic pipeline. Princeton took the camera, and Princeton also built the photometric pipeline. University of Washington built the, the telescope system, and Fermilab did the data integration. And we were the last to join the consortium, and so there was that nobody wanted to do. So we didn't have much choice, and I started to build our databases. And, and also Hopkins built the spectrographs. And in the, all, the, from the very beginning, we had lots and lots of debate, who is the archive, who is the whole project for, and who is the archive for? And the, the NSF was insisting from the very early on that the data should be made public. We all agreed, except that we, you know, in 1992, how to, we saw that the whole data that we will actually release to the public in terms of catalogs will be half a terabyte. Okay, even half a terabyte. So uh, making something accessible and making something public are two different things. So nominally, if we burnt basically a bunch of CDs, that, by the way, CDs were also just about emerging at the time, so, or CD-ROMs. So if we dumped a few thousand CD-ROMs on the NSF program officer's desk, then that we would have delivered the data to the NSF, but it would have hardly been that we to be. Anyway, so, so there was lots and lots of discussion. And also we had to realize that this is meaning this is introducing a new trend in science. So in many ways, until then, this typical process of science was that a scientist sat down, designed an experiment, took the data, collected the data, then analyzed the data, and then published the paper, and possibly published the data with the paper for repeatability. But here, we essentially had to do first to, basically, we had to publish the data to, to be able to analyze it even, because we already had to go through all the motions of calibrating, organizing the data, making it accessible, even though there was a little proprietary time. 
the original idea was that we should have a two-year two proprietary period. That was obviously unrealistically long, especially given that we were getting quite a lot of public funding. Then we agreed on roughly a one-year proprietary period. But then there was this meeting at Hopkins where a bunch of NSF people were in the room and we were arguing about the de delays and, and how the data would be actually published, etc. And it was very contentious. So, so we were at each other's throats entirely. And then Jim Crocker, who was the, the project manager of Sloan then, he's, uh, he's a person who, you know, I learned what project management is about. So he's the person who built the, the co-star, the fix for the Hubble Space Telescope. Then he built and designed the whole VLT observatory when he was in Munich. And then he came to Sloan and in six months he turned it around. And anyway, on this meeting, so there were, it was about 11.30. And then we were at each other's throats. The knife was in, you know, as they say, the knife could be stuck in the air. Uh, and then Jim said, well, when I was in Europe, I used to go to Florence. And my favorite restaurant, there is a small place, which on the top of the menu says that if you, thus you may have to wait a little bit longer, but we all guarantee that it will be worth it. So he said, let's go and eat. <laughs> And so we went out to lunch, and after lunch, on, on a full stomach, we all settled, and we all agreed. And what the agreement was in the end is that we came up with a timeline. So the, of course, we were on a yearly cycle, and we always have to shut down the telescope in New Mexico for part, some of the summer months because the weather is just simply too bad. So, and, and then uh, basically most of the <coughs> In most of the fall season, we can only observe the southern sky. So the natural point for a data release was during the, during the summers. And so what we agreed upon that every summer we will do a major data release. So we will only do quantized data releases once a year with the Sloan project. And then this will be in the summers. And, and we created that fractional timeline, how the data accumulative uh, timeline, how the data will be collected and how it will be released, the respective fractions, and there were this year the milestones. Okay, so this looked good, everybody agreed. And what happened afterwards is that, of course, everything was slipping, some of the, the mirrors were cracked, and all sorts of problems arose. So in the end, before the first, the so-called early data release, we got the data about seven or eight days before the data release actually happened. So there was no proprietary period, and this pretty much persisted through the end of the project. So the collaboration saw the data at the same time as the public. There was essentially no proprietary time on Sloan, except for the very last data release when we actually had about a six to nine months heads up finally. So then we caught up with ourselves. So. Originally, we thought we would take two and a half trillion pixels of images. We kind of stayed on it, except that with now with Sloan 3, we actually covered the area, we covered more imaging area in the end. So, so we took all together about five trillion pixels of imaging. We thought we would take about 10 terabytes of raw data that roughly doubled, but with all the versions of the data and different calibrations that we went through and different processings. So right now, we are at roughly 120 terabytes of process data that we have to store and archive. And we thought, we were very naive, we saw that the catalogs will be about half a terabyte on these early planning meetings. Today we have more than 35 terabytes in, data, in the different versions of the database. So it's, it's substantial. Uh, what is interesting is that basically had we finished on time, there, we could not have done this, of course, because it was more slow who was helping us to be able to reduce the data much faster these days. And it is also quite slow that these prices have been falling dramatically until the last year, so we could actually easily afford to buy a lot more disks for the processing. And so originally the data was turned out of Fermilab, but now with Sloan 3, the imaging, once we completed the imaging and everything, we have also moved the whole data archive now to Hopkins. It's done from our building. Okay, a little bit about, quickly about the budget. So when, when we joined 
the project was supposed to be about $25 million in 92. That was the projection. And uh, the expectation was that roughly the telescope and the instruments would cost all about the same amount of money, so roughly eight to $10 million. And we would write, we would spend on the software and the data processing about two million. Okay, so at the end, it was a, about roughly $120 million at the end of the day. After 18 years and roughly a third, a third, a third was the breakdown. So we made a gross underestimation in the way the data was processed and analyzed and how much effort has gone into the writing the code. It was really remarkable. And there was a very interesting dynamics between the particle physicists who have been dealing with big data and the astronomers who have more software as individuals. So again, there was this meeting at Fermilab when the astronomers went in and said, okay, let's decide who is writing what subroutine tomorrow. And the Fermilab people who, in particle physics, let's write down a 200-page requirements document first. And, and it took about two years to sort this out. And until we learned from each other, because the particle physicists had to learn that we, the particle physics model is not applicable to astronomy because they are basically doing a very organized data reduction where they decide early on they want to do sort of three or four types of experiments on top of the data and they hierarchically reduce the data like they went to find the Higgs. And so on in astronomy, basically everything goes. So we make the data available and every astronomer can potentially run different types of patterns on, and ask different kinds of questions on the data. And these two different cultures came to a fairly serious clash, but it was peacefully resolved. So, so we built the sky server with Jim. So yeah, so the database had also a story. So, it started, the whole project started at around the same time as the Human Genome Project. And so I asked one of the database guys from the Human Genome Project to come to one of our first meetings when we were talking about it, so that what database should we use? And it, at that time, object-oriented databases were the coming, up and coming thing, the next beautiful thing. And so we said, okay, we really want to use object-oriented databases. And the guy smiled, said we have been doing the Human Genome Project for two years are already on our third different database. So the only lesson I can tell you that we learned is to document everything clearly and design the database in an abstract fashion in a high-level tool so that you can migrate easily, because you will. And, and he was right. So we started out with something called Versant, an object-oriented system. In one year, we decided that this didn't really work. Then we switched to something called objectivity, which was at that point very, very fast, and it was used by Bob, the big flag experiment on the collider. Then the company expanded and brought in a whole bunch of new people, rewrote the whole kernel, and the code slowed down by a factor of 20. Because they brought in just incompetent programmers, basically. And at that point, we started to have serious problems. But we kind of stuck it out for another three, four years. But it was clear at, at that time that this is not going to work and not going to scale. And so then I had a meeting with Jim Gray, who got interested in astronomy data. Jim Gray was uh, one of Microsoft's, or of the world's top database people. So he designed transactions, he, how transaction processing is done. So every bank transaction and every teller machine is based on his ideas. How you can exchange information that even if all sorts of errors can happen, you don't lose money in the transaction. And <clears throat> anyway, so at that point he was building the Terra server, which was taking a whole bunch of images from the USGS and looking and store those images and built mosaics on the fly for Microsoft. Microsoft didn't really want to do this. They said, who the hell want, will want to look at their own backyard? But they let Jim get away with it because he said that this will show how scalable our database server is. So he built a small cluster, a bearable fly cluster out of SQL Server, and basically they did this project. And Jim got very interested that, okay, we had at that point more data than the Terra Server people, or, or potentially had more data than the Terra Server guys. 
And so it said, why, why don't we try to use then the same software and, and build on this? And then there we went. So the project at the same time said, OK, we already switched databases twice. You are not switching databases the third time. So we were forbidden to do this, basically. So we went anyway. But I will tell that story a little bit later. This was around 2010, roughly. To sort of Christmas 2010. And anyway, so we built, in the end, Jim and I basically just, just hacked it together with, with help of, of a bunch of people. And so we, so we built the Sky Server where we basically said, OK, let's not argue who is this for. Let's argue that this is for smart high school students. Okay. And that's, so this is not the official project database. This is an outreach tool. And then leave us alone. And this was on our own time. Anyway, so today we have more than a billion web hits on the database. Uh, we have 4 million distinct IP addresses of users. And there are only about 15,000 astronomers in the world. Uh, professionals, may, maybe 20,000, but, but that ballpark. So it's not 100,000, that it is not 5,000. So what we see is the emergence of the internet scientists because there are a bunch of people in that group who are actually doing interesting stuff. So they are not just looking at here and there an object that appears in the New York Times or something. So they are actually playing with data. It turns out, so the people have been doing now analysis Duccio Macchetto has been doing every year an analysis of citations of what are the words astronomy based upon the citation index. And now for several years in a row, this Sloan has been the top facility. And also, we have a collaborative environment enabling the so-called power users, which captures now a large fraction of the world's astronomy community. And we also built on top of Sloan also shops. One of the most famous is Galaxy Zoo, where we asked the public, Joel already showed some pictures. So it grew out of the idea that could we ask the public basically to visually classify some galaxy images, whether they are spirals or elliptical, and they are spirals, whether they are clockwise or counterclockwise rotating. Because there was a paper published which said that the north, the galaxies in the north, uh, towards the northern galactic cap and the southern galactic cap, have correlated rotation patterns, and it was visually classified by someone. Some of the postdocs in Oxford wanted to disprove this, and they set out basically to disprove this idea. To and after I think five or six thousand galaxies, they gave up. It was too tedious. And so the idea came, why don't we just post the images and ask the public to do uh, basically quick classification? All right. So we did that, by the way. <coughs> and after about a month, so we had a huge buy-in. But what we also found in the data, that there is a 4% asymmetry, indeed, roughly at the level which the guy in the original paper claimed. OK, but then we realized, ha, huh, what actually randomly started swapping Maybe there is a human that we preferentially code, we like, like to recognize in a noisy pattern, a clockwise versus counterclockwise. Once we started randomly swapping the images in mirror image or not in a blind way, then essentially this went away. So, so, it, so it turns out this was a human bias. Anyway, but what is then more interesting is the social dynamics of this, how people, when they had access to all this data, the, the computer gamer community started to build their own mashups. So they found odd-shaped objects. So there's, for example, a set of objects. I believe that's already in the Hubble Zoo, which was a perfect clef, you know, so like in a musical sign. So that was three interacting galaxies in just in a perfect pattern, quite, quite beautiful. And so they were people collecting images, and they were competing with each other that who can not find a nicer image for example. And then people started to write poems about it and write stories. And then once on the blog, around this was November 2007, a Dutch school teacher wrote a weird little splat she saw next to a galaxy, which wasn't even classified by the Sloan pipeline as an object. 
It was very blurry. It's even blurry here, even though this is done with different filter sets. Anyway, so this was, these were the Sloan galaxies. <coughs> but there was a little blur here. <coughs> but she wrote about it that it doesn't look like reflected light in the telescope. She thinks that this is real. And uh, um, in, uh, at, on Christmas Eve in 2007, the, there was nobody working at the La Palma telescope. And then uh, people who were, happened to be up there read the blog. And then they decided, why don't we just point in a broadband field basically at this object? And then this, and, and the ring-like structure ap appeared with a side lobe here. And then when they, afterwards, they got very excited. So this looked definitely a well-defined and interesting pattern. And then afterwards, they took a narrow band image or multiple narrow band filters. And it turns out that most of the energy comes out in the H alpha line, which happened to be redshifted to be to such a redshift that the most of the light came out in between two Sloan filters, exactly in the notch between two filters. So therefore, it was very, very faint in the Sloan imaging. And the idea is that this is, so there is only one such object known in the sky where there is such a huge equivalent uh, width for the lines. That's the so-called Minkowski's object, which is just about, I think, five arc minutes off of one of the Sloan stripes, unfortunately. Anyway. So this became a big thing. This is called Hannes Forwerp. And this has been now observed by Space Telescope, by Galax, by the VLT, or, and then, then also by the VLA in radio. So, so this became a big thing. And then also the, the gamers have found another group, whole, whole class of galaxies, which were not on the, kind of on the regular classification diagrams. These are called green peas. Because the false colors we made for Sloan, they appear to be green. They are, comp they are very compact galaxies, but still they are not ellipticals. So, so there have been a whole bunch of studies since then about the green peak galaxies. And this is the paper, this is the paper in, by the, in Physics World, for example, that how the Sloan survey is basically ahead of many other observatories. The counting, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the astronomy community altogether, so the people who write papers have embraced this as basically as a main research tool and a main research facility. <coughs> okay. I, I have so, so I, I believe that they were really just, they were, I think they were simply uh, scanning the, so they were looking queries, yeah, so the top 200 papers in ADS. Okay, so, so whatever criterion they use. So I think here, again, who is number one, number two, in, in many ways it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, uh-huh, well, so I, I believe that also at this point, a substantial fraction, so I have seen these figures about the data reuse also in the Hubble archive, and the data reuse is now like, like three to one or something in the, for the most recent. It was very little in the beginning, and then I think after the Hubble deep field and kind of Sloan, so these were roughly happening at the same time. They caused the whole sociological change in astronomy, so it is now okay to use archival data. Sorry? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. So, thanks. Okay. So, what was the goal in the sky? It was to provide individual access to data, illustrate that once we have an advanced content, it doesn't mean a cumbersome interface. Sun was about 14 or 15 at the time, and when we, with Jim, we the first kind of storyboards or, or templates for the data sky server, he kind of looked at it and said that no high schooler will look at the site if you leave it like that. And so he showed me some of his computer games. And so he was our one person focus group, basically. <coughs> and, and he helped really enormously to actually guide us what, what is considered cool by that community. Then. We also wanted to understand how people will interact with this. So from day one, 
we actually started a very detailed logging system. So we have essentially every user interaction on the site since June 2000, uh, 2001 is logged. So our whole log database is now close to two terabytes. <coughs> we already at that time realized with Jim that once we start to have serious amounts of data, we have to bring the, a lot of the <coughs> analysis close to the data. So we felt that this would be a really good way to demonstrate this. And so we started to not just put the data in a database, but on top of the data, we built, started to build a whole lot of so-called user-defined function, which, where we encapsulated the astronomy knowledge in functions that everybody can execute. And uh, people contributed a lot of code, like Manu there has written basically the library, which do all the curve space time, so you can put in different cosmologies, and it converts redshift into angular diameter distance, luminosity distance, and so on, so you can run on the data in those terms rather than just the observables. And again, for the target audience, especially since we were kind of working on the side, we targeted advanced high school students, but eventually even the astronomers on board. So I remember we had also a lot of debate, for example, about whether we wanted color JPEGs. And so the collaboration told us nobody wants JPEGs, that those are not good enough. Basically, we want the FITS, access to the FITS images. And then about two or three years later, it was really nice to get an email from Michael Blanton. So he was one of the people who argued about this originally. And he built a big pool of servers which stored all the Sloan imaging at NYU. And Michael sent me an Okay, so how do I quote your JPEGs generation? Because I found it really useful. So I didn't have to fire off a FITS viewer. I just clicked on it with basically a web browser and I could see everything I wanted to see. So, <coughs> so this kind of, and then also we built heavy multilingual capabilities from the start and the style sheets. And so it turns out that once we kind of had the overall side design, Jim asked his friend Curtis Wong, who eventually built the Worldwide Telescope. He, is, he was the head of uh, the Microsoft Research Multimedia Division. He, built, he got an Oscar for several of his work in computer animation and visualization. And then he looked at the style sheets and he changed nothing on the site. He just tweaked the style sheets. So the fonts, the sizes, the color schemes, and suddenly the site kind of became alive. It, it was really remarkable what a professional can do when, when they touch this and how different it is when just astronomers start to do artwork. So. MyDB was, I think, in terms of the technical capabilities, MyDB was a really important step. So, so once we did the logs, what we saw in the beginning, that a lot of people fire, fired up big queries, which took, for example, you know, uh, return the data set of a million rows or something. Then we spent about a few seconds of running the query. The database is quite fast. But then sending a million rows of data across the wire to the university took actually several minutes. And then what we saw that five minutes later, then another version of the query came back from the same user. And it was obvious they couldn't do a very detailed analysis. All they could do in, in the remaining minutes to take this table and very quickly do a couple of fast XY plots and saw that the scatter plot doesn't quite look right. This is not what I wanted. So they tweaked the query, run it again and again and again. And this was a tremendous burden on the server because the query was finished, but it was all in a holding state, in the, sit, the data sitting in a buffer until we could actually send it off on the slow wide area network. And so Nolan came up with the idea by looking at the logs that <coughs> we give the users their own little databases next to the main database server on a very fast connection, which is just inside the computer room and then give them some tools to generate their own XY plots if that's, that's what they want to do. Because it would be much cheaper to send a PNG or a GIF image across the net than a million lines, than, than all the data that, need, that is needed to make up that figure. So we did that, and it worked like a charm. So the, essentially the server load went up substantially because there were things were not blocking each other. 
So, so at, and afterwards, we basically, so this was the last stage when we saw kind of a rapid growth in the traffic. Afterwards, whatever hardware we put in, it kind of reached the natural saturation. Anyway, but then the users came back to us that, okay, I have my, my DB, but can I actually take this table and share with my friends because we are working on the same paper? So we created then kind of like Unix-like uh, rights, access rights. So there, was a, there is the owner, there is the group, and there is a word. So you can make a table group visible and word visible. And then after a while, people also started to ask, okay, so can I just make this, this is the table that made it into my paper, can I make it word visible? And then essentially this was a way of publishing the data. So this really became a nice collaborative environment. Today we have 6,800 registered users. So this is a very substantial fraction of the world's astronomy community who are using this on a daily basis. So we started a bunch of tutorials and guides, and this again started like folk songs. So everybody added a little bit, and a lot of volunteers came, and people wrote different sections. So we really had very little time to create this whole environment. And so Jordan Reddick came in, and he has been writing a lot of tutorials, and it, he wrote about even things how to use Excel and how to plot data, how to use a database. It that now the guide to SQL is now everywhere or, or quite a lot of places on the web. If you look for a SQL tutorial, it, it, will, bring, it, it will bring you to this site. Uh, and then there was a really major step forward when we went through in the beginning lots of changes, schema changes. And a database consists of a fairly rigid schema. So it has rows and columns, and the columns basically store the data but every column has different data types potentially, and the, data, and the numbers don't have a meaning without knowing what their physical units are and what is their meaning. And we started to write all these documentations, but it very quickly got out of sync. So we made a change in the database and we always were in a rush and we never updated the documentation. So it was getting out of hand. And so what we ended up doing is adopt the same philosophy as Donald Knud did with his tech, software, so he wrote everything in such a way, he wrote a big script, and if you parse it one way, he generated the code for tech. If you generate it another way, if, if you parse it another way, he generated the documentation for tech. So we basically used the comments in, a SQL, in the SQL language to put in all sorts of markup tags, and if, so we could run the scripts, and the, as, as we run the scripts, they generated the database but then we could, spar we could parse it, run it through a parser, and then it generated documentation which we could upload into the database into yet another tables. But the two were, since the two were derived from the same script, if we made a change somewhere, it automatically propagated at a push button. So, and, and this, this was an enormous, an enormous help. And then we also, so, we, so this is how we created the searchable help and documentation features, and this is all generated now on the fly. With the visual tools, we wanted to emulate a little bit what basically at that point <coughs> the Microsoft uh, Terra server was. So how, to, how do we connect pixel space to object without typing queries? So overlays, and actually now everybody takes this for granted with Google. Google Maps and Visual Earth and, or Bing and, and MapQuest. But basically, so we had at that point 200,000 images which were all 2K by 1, 1,500 times five colors. Today we have about a million images, actually. And now we will probably, so over the next few weeks we will have to rebuild again for DR9 the color JPEGs, and I expect that it will take about three servers and roughly three days to do the whole thing. So it's, it's getting easier and easier. Anyway, and, but we did not only put a little, we, we can not only put a little cross or a little circle on the objects that we detected. For every object, we actually store the geometric boundaries. So we can draw an outline of all the pixels that belong to the object and are used by the photometry or the bounding boxes. And we also need a large dynamic range of scales, two to the 13th. That's not a 
small number. And it, we try to architect in such a way that there are a very small number of web services which do all the work. And you can just call them differently with different parameters and different contexts. And then you can mesh them up different ways. So basically, there is an image cutout web service. There is a query service against the database. And then all the things, the images and overlays, we build on the web server. So such a way, we can, it can run on pretty much any generic browser. And there is now, right now, a conversion going on for DR9 to offer also HTML5. So we are trying to move with the times. So. so again, so what we have is a whole bunch of different applications on top of the same core services. So we have, for example, a finding chart which can generate an image of arbitrary size. We have a navigator which is a little bit like MapQuest where you can then interactively kind of step up and down, left and right, and so on. But that has a fixed image size. And then you can also take a bunch of images. You may have a shopping cart, even. Uh, we don't call it that, because I think that has been probably patented by Amazon. Uh, but basically, the idea is that if you find an object that looks interesting, you can click it, and you can store it in your cart. And then you can generate, basically, you can click on the cart, and it will generate a page, a tabular page of all the images and links back to the database to that object. So you don't have to manually take notes, basically. And all those things. And these are all linked to each other. And then one can also go to the image explorer <coughs> or then the object explorer. So all those things, you can navigate the database without actually typing queries. <coughs> and again, so the images, they were five bands, roughly six megabytes each. This with uh, Sloan 3 has changed to 12 megabytes each and a million objects. So, so the data is growing quite large. And anyway, so we built the composite color images. And we threw away the UNZ for the composite color because they were just too noisy. So they added noise. So we did the mapping that the green, the Sloan green is mapped onto the blue. Then the R is mapped on green, and the I is mapped on to the RGB. And then we did a compression of the uh, A-shine compression of the luminosity of the object. So we added up the three fluxes in the GRI bands. Then from this aggregate luminescence, we took a logarithmic compression with a linear transfer at around zero crossing in A shine, and then multiplied back with the colors afterwards. So the colors are properly preserved. The intensity of the light is compressed. So such a way, we basically can map the enormous range, dynamic range of the objects to, the, to a typical 8-bit screen. So, so it's, it's acceptable. And then the resulting image is stored as a JPEG. And then we stitch it together in a mosaic. And then with all this object overlay, send with the pixel outlines and so on. And basically, we can do this right. The whole thing is about 1,500 lines of C-sharp code, roughly. C-sharp is a language you will hear probably more about. It's essentially Microsoft answer to Java. And, and it has a lot of advantages, especially when you work with databases. But you can run the code on any platform from Linux to Windows, anywhere, basically. But the trick was to we had to implement all sorts of different projection systems so that we can convert the, from the image. Basically, we had to convert first from the image XY to RE and DEC, and then the RE and DEC to the screen. X, Y. So, so multiple astronomical transformations or astrometric transformations have to take place. Then we have lots of geometries. And after a while, it became clear that what people wanted is to do fairly sophisticated spatial searches. And this was also becoming very interesting. The, he wanted to do more, he wanted to have much more GIS functionality inside the databases, also for the Earth. And so there was a lot of back and forth between the people who are building, who were building SQL Server. And to have an interface and an architecture that will support all these sophisticated functions. So, so I, basically, we wrote our own GIS system, and almost entirely in SQL at the time. And this was part of, 
uh, and then eventually some of the routines moved to C++. And then this was one example of when the new SQL Server came out in 2005 that started to support external libraries so that you could take your own source code, you could build an object class, and then you could actually link that object class to the database so that it executed with the kernel. And so our example, this GIS system for astronomy, which we translated to basically Earth view and let LON instead of RE and DEC, that was part of the Shrinkwrap SQL Server package in the code samples directory. And then Tomas has converted it to C Sharp. It became quite a bit faster because also the calling overhead for, for the C Sharp interface and, and calling was very much more efficient than the old C external start, store procedures. And here we can pre-compute arcs and so on, and we can also pre-compute now whole, sphere, whole spherical regions. And I think Tomas will talk more about all this. But basically, this gave us a fairly, um, fairly sophisticated framework to deal with all sorts of spatial queries and represent and compute areas. And then this is now also applied by the Hubble Legacy Archive, so the same library. And that was a real torture test. So when Tomas was debugging the code on the Hubble Deep Field, which had like hundreds and hundreds of visits, and then all these were deterred a little bit, so there were intersections between regions which had a tiny, which were as narrow as a fraction of a Hubble's pixel. So, so that was, and we had to represent that, and 120 degree wide, basically, scans of the Sloan survey. So both of those had to be equally rep represented. And this just shows some of the complicated regions that, that arose inside the Sloan. Coming from the scanning pattern and the spectroscopic circles, and then also there were some regions which were simply declared bad. So, so these are typical regions that we had to compute for the completeness of Sloan. Okay. Overall, so in astronomy, Sloan is just a step along the journey. And so we have seen that in Redshift surveys, we have gone basically from CFA in 1986 up to, you know, 750,000 galaxies in 2005. Today we have about 2 million objects in the Sloan Spectroscopic Database. Okay, LSST, yeah, so this is a not too updated slide. Then LSST was projected to start in 2012. Now it is 2018. I think the number is still correct. And, but anyway, if you just look at the length of the numbers, basically, that illustrates what is going on. Plus, here we are entering the era of the time domain, which is an entirely new, so, an entirely new realm. So, so far, we were always looking at the static sky, except for a few very small projects like Macho. So, so in this context, SDSS2 has finished with DR7, and the database was around 10 terabytes. SDSS3 had one last run of imaging, completed the area between the sudden stripes, and then returned entirely of the imaging camera for good. We rebuilt the spectrograph, so it has now, I think, more than 1,000 fibers. It has a slightly higher dispersion, so higher resolution, and it is shifted a bit more to the red. DR8 was out in 20 is coming in a couple of weeks, and the database will be about between 12 and 13 terabytes. And the planning has already started for AS3, which is after Sloan 3. And so what, and there the ideas are, for example, to have also an instrument, where, so we basically we would build some fiber feeds, which are not a thousand individual fibers, but they would form a coherent fiber bundle, so we could do basically integral field spectroscopy. Okay, so this is the SESS genealogy. So there's the Sky Server and Cass Jobs and my. Okay, and then of the spin offs are, which really reuse some of the code, is, include the Galaxy Zoo, then the Turbulence Database, then Super Cosmos and UK in Edinburgh, Hubble Legacy Archive, then Sky Query and all the VO services, all the virtual observatory stuff, then from the Turbulence. Then, then also, we'll talk more about the Millennium. Stars and Palomar Quest have been using this framework. The Galaxy are based upon this. 
And then here, people have also taken our code and built a radiation oncology database. We built a sensor database for environmental work, and we are right now building some thousand genomes based upon the same framework. Then from the Millennium, there are also various spin-offs. So the Potsdam guys are putting in Bolshoi in the same framework. Then Bridget is probably, I don't know if there will be student talks, but Bridget is working on the Indra simulation where we will take 512 large embody simulations and basically store it in the same framework. With Piero Mado, we are working on a Milky Way, large Milky Way simulation. And then here we are also building databases about uh, MHD turbulence and so on. And the Virtual Observatory started roughly at the same time when Sloan became live. And it was obvious that in other wave bands, IPAC and, and other organizations worked on the same problem and Hubble and how to organize basically the multi-wavelength data in such a way that the public can use. And afterwards, it shortly became clear that there is a need to build a system that also federates all of this together. And we started with an NSF ITR project, which was funded only a little bit from the astronomy division. It was mostly funded by the digital libraries group. So in astronomy, they did not feel that this was important. But, but kind of grudgingly went ahead with a little bit of seed money. So it involved essentially pretty much everybody in the country who had large astronomy data sets. And it started the framework. And it kind of spread all over the world. And it created a grassroots organization called IVOA, International Observatory, which then kind of took over the standards body for, for this, so to creating new standards and interfaces and the protocols to share data with the common goal to build a single system out of all these astronomy data collections all over the world. And today, so or over, the, over the last two years, NASA has jointly started the VAO, the Virtual Astronomical Observatory. Um, unfortunately, this last year, uh, the budget has been cut by a factor of two as a result of the upcoming crunch in astronomy. And, and unfortunately, this, this is the world we are going to have to live in in the next few years, where probably every dollar counts. Okay. So these are just some of the core services. So, but the idea is altogether to create some simple services. And we accomplished this with more or, more or less success. I think we were successful in creating lots of protocols. We were less successful in implementing them. And this is kind of the challenge we are facing right now. But these are, for example, how to find data resources, so how to have a yellow pages for data, how to access images, how to get to tabular data. And then this created that standard, which is sort of between XML and tabular data called VO table. Then Herat has been leading the effort how to form, how to build interfaces on top of simulation data that is standardized. And Mike has been collaborating on this quite a lot. Then Tomas was leading the footprints effort. How do we describe basically the footprints of observation surveys and images on the sky and make it all searchable and intersectable? Then we built a VO spectrum interface and so on. And Tomas will also talk about more about the sky query where we can take multiple catalogs and cross match them very, very fast. So what are the challenges? In the, in the last years, we learned that the challenges are typically not technical and not technological. They are sociological. How do we make people change their ways? And we have to, and the lesson is that people will not change, we build it and they won't come. Okay, unless we offer them something that is substantially different, new, cheaper, better, or faster. And it has to be at least two or three of the above. Or they see that all their friends are using it, so the peer pressure. So like, you know, what, what happened with Facebook. We have to build trust, and building trust takes time. So it's very easy to lose trust, and it's very hard to build trust. And scientists want trustworthy calibrated data with occasional, so they always have to be able to get all the way down to the raw data. 
Otherwise, they will not believe anything they see. And I think, for example, we did accomplish with Sloan. I don't think we have quite accomplished with the virtual observatory as a whole. So that's one of the big challenges in front of us for the next few years. There is a lot of lip service today out about how society needs people with big data experience and so on. But still, if you build data set, it is very difficult to actually get a faculty job out of it. So, so it, and it has to come with grants. So this is a challenge on the funding agencies. Threshold, the threshold for publishing data is way too high. So if I have my own data set and I want to publish, then in the virtual observatory, it will start with, OK, fill out this metadata form in XML and the following three pages if I want to publish an image. And a lot of people decide that, OK, this is just not worth my time doing it. It has to be much, much simpler than that. And we are also learning that there is a big distance between a prototype that we build and a robust code that, that hundreds of people can use every day. And one of them can be easily built by a graduate student. And for the second, you need somebody who is actually a really good programmer. And then the archives exist on all scales. So we have some very large archives with, you know, the, soon there will be LSSD with 100 petabytes. And there will be archives which only contain maybe a few thousand images. But they all have to be part of the same fractal hierarchy. And one can argue that astronomy has successfully passed the, passed the first hurdles. I think we see how the community is embracing a lot of these ideas. And the fact that we are all sitting here also means that I think people are starting to be increasingly aware. But, but what also we have to be prepared that this is, there will be no moment of instant gratification. This is a journey. And, and this is a journey that I think there are now enough people in this room that I think if you all pick up something useful during this school, I think that will make a difference. And that will not just one step closer to the ultimate goals. And one can see the kind of this process, how we went from Sloan to Penn Stars and now to LSST. So basically, just in the number of pixels, this is an enormously large growth. But we can ask, OK, how long does the data growth continue? Because we are not going to build a new LSST every two years. And people are starting to talk about SKA, which will generate exabytes. But really, right now, in the very short run, I just don't see how the money is going to emerge in the next five to 10 years. So it will be probably has to wait beyond once LSST is kind of built and running. Anyway, but the point is that how long does the data growth continue? Once we build the world's largest instrument, like the LHC, then the high end is always linear. We turn it on, and it puts our data at a constant rate. And of course, the exponential growth from when we replace certain parts of the system, usually the detectors, with something much better, which comes at the Like building a new camera onto an existing telescope. And this is what Arc Energy Survey is doing right now. Or this is why they are going to turn off CERN at the end of the year, and they replace the magnet by increasing the energy. In such a way, you don't have to rebuild your whole infrastructure, but at an incremental cost, you can actually double or triple the throughput. So one can argue that how many generations of instruments are, do we have left in astronomy? And certainly in optical astronomy, it's not at all obvious that there are so many obvious big things that we can do any longer after kind of LSST is built or we build a 30-meter telescope. Or we built, so maybe in radio there is more room to grow because there we are just switching to silicon focal plane arrays in the radio telescopes, which will generate where the limit is silicon. But what we need to realize, and this is getting back to the theme of the school, that software is becoming a new kind of instrument. So the high performance computers, so we are generating both value added data from the existing data collections. We also will do some hierarchical data replication like CERN does, that, that they have all the CERN data that's coming out of the detectors sitting at, at the tier zero data center. They create tier ones for all the major experiments, which are located in several different countries. Then for within that, within Atlas, all the different reductions are going to different tier two centers. And then some 
bits of the analysis are done at, at T3 centers at a typical university. And I think a similar structure is being recommended for LSST, for the LSST science data. So we will see more of that. But this is why we are partly here for. So once we have large and complex simulations, these, the high performance computers, supercomputers today are basically putting out increasingly more and more amounts, larger amounts of data. However, right now we don't really have a good way to deal with those. So, what, so very often the simulations we can either put out basically too few time steps or, or it limits basically overall the performance of the simulation. And so here in 2000, a uh, group in Garshing and Dara built the Millennium Simulation, and we will hear more about this in Herard's talk. We generated more than 30 terabytes of data, most of them over the dark matter particles. Okay, and much of this went on to tape drives in the Garshing Rechen Centrum which was not read too many times. And it, because it was so hard to get access to, so double firewalls and tape robots pulling it off of there, you, you can imagine how it goes. But then Herard built a database, a SQL Server database out of it, which also has some clever user-defined functions and organized the data. This was not all the dark matter particles, just the halos, subhalos, and the galaxies, the result of semi the galaxy formation. And basically, one can do all sorts of interesting things with the database. And, and I think Darren and Riza, Joel, so everybody has an overlapping interest in this. So this, I think, changed the way we look at simulations today. And now 10 years have passed, gone past, or 12 have gone past since. So today we can do simulations, you know, with 10 to the with a trillion particles. However, the same group ran Millennium XXL, and they were only able to store four snapshots of the dark matter particles because simply it was too expensive to store it on the disk, and it, even that data is very hard to move. And so they have still the usual 64 or 128 snapshots of the halos and subhalos, which is much smaller. They want to study the dark matter distribution, basically they hit the brick wall. And, and still, the community is using the Millennium Simulation, even though there are much better, much higher resolution, much more sophisticated simulations, because it became a reference. And every paper, who, or, or many papers, uh, dealing with galaxy formation, they can basically, comp then you can compare it to previous papers, so it established itself as a reference scenario. And of course, this, you need a certain luck to be at the right place at the right time, but in a sense, this is what we would like to do to make it much easier for the next generation to build these databases and interfaces like the Millennium in, in here. And then, of course, all the questions arise that also, once we have the data, from a simulation in a database that can be accessed and queried just like the observations, how do we, what is the best way to compare to the real data? And kind of this is really the theme of the school, so I would like to stop here, but I, I was hoping that I kind of try to describe the journey over the last 10 years and, and that the next 10 years will be even more exciting and at a faster pace than what we have seen so far. Thank you. Well, so interesting as you speak. So basically, Tomas and Richard Wilton in Baltimore has built an interface, by the way, between GPUs and databases, how we can stream data directly into GPUs, and now Microsoft wants to turn it into the product. So, so we have been just looking at actually a, the prototype, uh, so, so the kind of formal requirements design document. So, so it, is, it is happening, yeah. And, and also, by the way, you know, Microsoft included GPUs into direct compute. So, so if you have, for example, a laptop with a G, little GPU chip built in that can do the codecs and the movies, if you also decompress a JPEG image that is, if, if the laptop recognizes that it has GPUs, it will automatically, within Windows, it will use the GPU wherever it can. And I think we will see more and more of this, that certain operations are being downloaded. And by the way, also, so Jack Dongara, the, Jack Dongara, the guy who wrote LAPEC, is now very, very 
so spending uh, basically almost all his time on working on GPUs, basically how to improve the layback and uh, large matrix operations and arrays on getting better performance out of GPUs today. So, so, so there are as a whole sea of changes coming there. So. So partly, so there are still very few of the systems that support user-defined functions. So you can those easily in SQL Server, in Oracle, in uh, Postgres. There are severe limitations in MySQL, unfortunately. So you can only do scalar-valued user-defined functions. So if you want to return an array, you have to pack it into a binary blob. And then after you return that, you have to do the extra step of unpacking into an in-memory table in MySQL. So it's a pain in. But, but basically, it, it's, get, it's getting there. It's getting there. Altogether, I think people are starting to realize that when you have large structured data where you do need indexed access, when you don't, so, so there's so much hoopla about MapReduce and Hadoop and so on. They are very useful for certain things. When you want to quickly access localized data sets, you want to get to a certain part of a simulation, etc. there is nothing like a good index. And yes, you can use an HDF5 uh, with its own indexing, etc. but then you also, that's essentially already, one can argue that the HDF5 is a database system already in itself, maybe without a query language, but. But uh, so, so I think so. It it would be it would be really nice if if MySQL kind of took a notch up because then that that's really a database that that's freely available for everyone. And but uh, basically, we were able to take the whole spatial search framework. And LSST's default database scenario is right now a big sharded array of MySQL nodes. And, and basically, in collaboration with people at IPAC and Slack, we were able to convert it to entirely automatically to C++ and then to MySQL. So, so they can run essentially the same user defined functions now in the LSST prototype as we can as well. It just, uh, Yeah, so, so basically, so Hadoop and MapReduce are very, very good, first of all, to handle kind of unstructured data, where, where you really know very little about the data, and you just kind of lay it out on disks and then, then launch a big crawler over it. So it offers a very convenient programming paradigm for the user, because the user doesn't have to know where the data sits, how the data will be accessed, and what happens when something fails. So typically, data is stored redundantly. And everything is broken up into two programming steps. One is a map function that you apply to every data element, which will then derive either a hash key or something or extract certain keywords from the document. And the next step is a reduce step, which will then, based upon the results of the map function, it will pick up certain elements and deliver to another location specified by this hash. OK. And the way you run a big, uh, lots of programs, that you have a crawler going round and round like a big Ferris wheel over the data. And then basically, all the programs on the same data item, all the map functions issued by different people are executed all at the same time when that block of data is in memory. So it's in, a, in many ways, it's a very simple, ultra simple I.O. scheduler. So people in the database world have spent 20, 30 years in writing the databases. And most of the smarts in the database is how to schedule the I.O. for the mix of workloads. Some of it is sequential reads, other is random access, and so on. And how to co-schedule that they don't destroy each other. In Hadoop, they, they kind of cut all the way through with a sword. So let's say we will only do big sequential scans, like it or not. And if you have random access patterns, too bad. And so, it's, if you, so if your problem is sequential access, then, then it is fine. 
the performance is about 10 times poorer than if you actually run your own high performance system. So, so it does a terrible, the Hadoop file system is terrible and so, so on and all those things. These were hacked together in Java for, and, and, but at the same time, it is very scalable, so you can run it on 100,000 computers or 200,000 computers, it will not blink an eye. So, but if you have a random access pattern, then databases have an advantage. And basically, Google is going now from actually running simple MapReduce, they went to big table, which, half, which is halfway between, basically, a, they, it already offers some structure, so organizes data into very big tabular columns, where still the elements can be arbitrary data types or data objects. And on top of this, they built now a full SQL implementation called Tenzing. So, so, my, so Google actually has on top of all this framework basically a full relational database, which is like Oracle. So, so, so it is clear that, that one is not a substitute. So I think we will see a world when, when basically this will somehow converge into a, into a single system. And Mike Stonebreaker is building SciDB, which is basically trying to aim at, at something like this. So that's how it works, but what do you uh -huh. think the significance of it is for astronomy? Oh. Okay, so I think a lot of our pre-processing patterns can be, so pipeline processing, et cetera, would map very nicely because we have a whole bunch of flies, files. We need to crawl through them, and essentially, depending on the result, we have to pick certain and place them into the reduced data to a certain. So one can argue that the map is, for example, the image segmentation that we are running on a photometric pipeline, and the reduces then loading them into a database, for example. So I, I can see, I can see how that would be mapped. I don't quite. I can see also if we have a huge amount of simulations, we can run a Hadoop job, for example, as the first stage of processing, where we take the simulation outputs and kind of repartition, reindex, etc., do all sorts of secondary post-processing extractions and so on. And when, I, when individual users come in, I, I don't see, and they want a fast response, I don't see Hadoop is the way to go. So this is very good for huge bad jobs which run for a day at a time. But you don't want a human to restore basically failed disk, you want the system to recover automatically. So, so, so I think there is a place especially if we could lay our hands on some big Hadoop resource that would not be paid for by us. So, so. Okay, any more questions?